Hello, my name is Riley Ferguson, and this is a presentation recorded for the International Humans in Space Summit uh, 2022. Um, I will be speaking today about 13 lined ground squirrels and a an novel animal model for spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome um, I have been developing here at the National Eye Institute. Um, my mentor is Dr. Wei Li, and I am working in the retinal neurophysiology department at the National Eye Institute, um, part of the National Institute of Health um, here in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, United States. I'm also uh, between my third and fourth years of medical school at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, taking this time as a research fellowship as part of the Medical Research Scholars Program. Um, also, I would like to acknowledge that this research was made possible through the NIH Medical Research Scholars Program, which is a public-private partnership supported jointly by the NIH and contributions to the Foundation for the NIH from the American Association for Dental Research, the Colgate Palm Olive Company, and other private donors. Um, for a complete list, please visit the donors at this foundation website, um, but I have no conflicts of interest or other financial disclosures. So uh, just to back up a little bit, I'd like to talk about the relationship between the National Institute of Health and NASA and space medicine more broadly. So NIH first collaborated with NASA um, all the way back in the 1960s on Project Gemini. And as recently as 2017, they established an understanding that NIH will have access to experiments um, and room for experiments on the International Space Station. We have an active um, space uh, scientific potential collaborative efforts group here on campus. And we also um, have the Tissue Chips and Space program that launched in 2018 through um, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Um, extramurally, there's also a an effort um, to develop 3D printing biological material in microgravity. So these, these were some of the reasons um, I chose to come to NIH to continue researching um, SANS and why I thought it would be a great opportunity to develop a, a model here. Um, so as, as most of you know, um, space flight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS is a retinal pathology that results in um, visual loss that is often permanent, permanent in um, up to 70% of astronauts. Um, this pathology is especially seen when there is microgravity exposure that is longer than six months um, and is thought to worsen in severity with prolonged exposures. Um, so NASA's Human Research Program has identified the most mission-critical health risks, and SANS was identified as one that um, required development of countermeasures um, for mitigation, especially for expedition class missions. So this is an area of research that needs attention, um, and we need to um, develop technologies to help out our astronauts um, get to where they're going. So uh, the thing about SANS is we um, understand that it might be secondary to the forward cephalic fluid shift that happens in microgravity. So secondary to that shift, there's thought to be increased intracranial pressure, intraocular pressure, and cephalic congestion. Um, and there's also thought to be um, the loss of normal venous blood drainage of blood from the brain and surrounding tissues, including the optic nerve sheath and the um, compartments within that sheath. Um, clinically, we see um, by MRI that there is globe flattening, um, papilledema, uh, optic nerve distension and cupping damage, and choroidal folding. These have all been visualized um, in cases of SANS using imaging techniques after they have returned back to Earth and also um, on station um, in lower Earth orbit. However, um, these changes don't fully explain what's taking place. Um, overall, it's possible the fluid pressure hypothesis is reductive and not considering um, all of the elements of the pathophysiology. 
For example, it's been demonstrated that there are increased reactive oxygen species within the retinal tissue, as well as optic nerve damage. We must also consider the deep space irradiation um, that's taking place in the true space flight environment. And there are several instances that have, are experiments that have demonstrated um, significant transcriptomic modification um, with space flown eyes. So there's perhaps more taking place than just a um, pressure question. And I think that's where we need to explore to really understand uh, the pathology. And that brings us to our animal model. So uh, this is a 13 lined ground squirrel um, that is found in the Northern hemisphere. Interestingly, they are a rodent that is cone dominated in their retinal population, which is similar to humans. Other rodent species, including mice and rats, are actually rod dominated, um, which makes it more difficult to draw comparisons from those animal models to the human eye. In addition, the 13 line ground squirrel has over 600,000 retinal ganglion cells, which is roughly one half of the total retinal ganglion cell population of the human eye. The mouse, for comparison, has about 100,000. So again, making it more difficult to draw true comparisons from that rodent model uh, to the human eye. Anatomically, they have a visual streak of a thickened retinal layer that serves as a foveal region sim similar to our fovea. And they also have all of the benefits of a rodent model, including the low cost of care um, and um, increased speed of rearing a colony that makes them more accessible than uh, non-human primate research that might be um, the most similar to the human eye. Um, Another fascinating, unique characteristic of the 13 lined ground squirrel is that they are an obligate hibernator. So every year they enter a natural torpor from November to March annually in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, during this hibernation, they are able to lower their basal metabolic rate by roughly 5%, which um, might not sound like much, but is actually um, extremely uh, significant as far as the amount of oxidative metabolism taking place. Their, their heart rate reduces to 20 beats per minute, and they are only taking about one breath every 20 minutes. Um, it's actually hard to tell in person um, that the animals are still alive. They're able to down, down regulate their metabolism so efficiently, um, but they do this every year from birth um, for several months. So what's really fascinating is um, it's possible that some of these down-regulated enzymes um, that the squirrel um, manipulates naturally could possibly be knocked down as a pharmaceutical target to replicate some of the effects of hibernation. And I'd like you to keep that in mind as we um, travel through the experiment. So um, one of the fundamental ideas of this is hibernation or synthetic torpor as a countermeasure, um, both for SANS and other spaceflight technologies. This is not a new idea in the literature. Um, there have been several experiments um, with zebrafish and beyond, which have suggested that um, radiation is less damaging um, in an animal that is hibernating or experiencing the effects of hibernation. Um, and what's exciting is that this squirrel can um, offer that to us as an experimental arm in our animal models. Um, one of the techniques used in this animal, animal model is hind limb unloading, which is a protocol developed to simulate microgravity um, in mice and rats, actually, that has been used broadly for um, several decades. It consists of lifting the animal's um, hind legs so that a forward cephalic fluid shift is replicated like the one we would expect in um, gravitational unloading that is experienced in, in space. These animals uh, tolerate this hind limb unloading exposure remarkably well um, and have been found to retain their body mass. They're able to freely feed and ambulate within the cage. Um, and have tolerated this exposure um, up to 180 days. Uh, and so here is the basic 
idea behind the experiment, which is we will start with two uh, groups of squirrels, one that remains under normal gravitational loading and the other half that is exposed to 90 days of hind limb and loading, replicating a long duration space flight exposure. Um, after 90 days, um, those two groups will again be split in half. Um, one will re uh, remain awake and not be allowed to hibernate or enter their natural torpor um, for the season, whereas the other half will enter their natural hibernation cycle. Um, when they begin to awake in the spring, um, at that time point for all of these squirrels, they will be collected for tissue analysis. I also want to point your attention to um, the red markers at the bottom showing the timeline. Um, this consists of a visual suite of testing um, that allows us to sample the clinical visual degradation of the animals as they uh, travel along this exposure. So here we have the Q14 visual suite of testing, which consists of um, OCT, um, which allows us to look at the uh, architecture of the retina at the back of the eye and is a common ophthalmic clinical imaging tool. Um, IOP, which taken by tonometer, allows us to see the um, intraocular pressure within the eye and ERG and VEP, which allow us to understand if the functional vision of the animal might be degrading as the exposure takes place. Um, tissue collection will take place either at day 90 um, or after the hibernation period has concluded. And what's very exciting about the capability of Dr. Lee's lab is that they are able to quantitatively analyze the population of retinal ganglion cells and tell us specifically if there's been a depletion of ganglion cells, astrocytes, microglial cells, and activation of those cells um, in response to these exposures. Additionally, we can perform a um, spatially resolved RNA transcriptome analysis and all of these changes are taking place without the confounding variable of radiation, which allow us to consider if these changes are truly secondary to the mechanism of the cephalic fluid shift, or if there's something else taking place in spaceflight that might be um, an additive factor of this pathology. Um, here we have um, a dissected and disdained uh, 13 lined ground squirrel retina. This is stained with rabbit IBA4 or IBA1, excuse me, staining of the retinal vasculature. Um, we have pretty great resolution with these stains and can even go so far as to quantify the arborization of this vasculature and see if there's been adapt adaptation or remodeling during the exposure. Uh, this is not 13 lined ground squirrel, but a mouse retina from the lab that has been stained um, to show the retinal ganglion cell population. And here we can see how um, a software can go in and actually count all of the different pixels um, shown in this image and quantify all of the ganglion cells present. Um, and to bring this, this home, I'd like to emphasize that all of this and space medicine more broadly is not only about the astronaut and improving their health outcomes. Of course, that's one of the goals. But when we uh, expose our physiology to a new environment, it often allows us to better understand our normal physiology. And this has great translational importance for other common disease models here on Earth, such as glaucoma or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, both of these deal with increased pressures either inside or behind the eye um, and are not entirely understood. Um, if we think very far down the road, um, we could even consider if one of these pathologies could be impacted by a torpor mim mimicking pharmaceutical if SANS were to respond to hibernation in a positive way. So ultimately, it's all about better understanding our own basic relationships. And if we can get a better hold of that, hopefully we can 
develop more effective countermeasures, not only for the space flight environment, but for our patient populations back on Earth. Um, and with that, these are my references. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Lee, everybody that's helped me in the Lee lab, um, Dr. Lightman and Dr. Burklow, uh, who are the leaders of the Medical Research Scholars Program, the National Eye Institute and University of Cincinnati. Um, I'd like to especially thank Drs. Rowena Christensen and Joshua Chow for the uh, inviting me to this International Humans and Space Summit, um, which is an incredible program. I'm also a member of the Women in Aerospace Medicine Program and the Space Surgery Association, um, both of which have provided wonderful mentors within the field of space medicine. Um, overall, I am very excited to be completing this research and new to the field. So I am um, looking for comments, feedback, and suggestions. If you are well-versed in high limb unloading, for example, or SANS pathology, um, and you think there's something critical that might be helpful to this experiment, um, I would love it if you would reach out. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'm available by email, um, both at my University of Cincinnati and NIH email. I'm also on Twitter um, as SpacemedFerg, and I would be happy to discuss uh, this proposed model and anything else on um, space medicine related. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and wish you a wonderful day.